Yeah, life is not always easy, right? And even church work is not always easy. Sometimes we have challenges, don't we? Sometimes we have sicknesses or hardships. Let's look at 3 John chapter 1. I know a lot of us were sick this week. My family was sick this week. And um, this passage went through my head. Look at 3 John 1, verse 1. The elder unto the well-beloved Gaius, whom I love in the truth. Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. It's not a bad thought, and there's nothing wrong with wishing someone to be in good health. You know that? Nothing wrong hoping that your brother or sister has good health. Well, of course, we know that God's in control. We know that God can use sickness for His reasons. But there's nothing wrong with hoping that someone's health is prosperous, just as their spiritual health is prosperous. Look verse 3. For I rejoice greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in thee, even as thou walkest in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that, thou, that my children walk in the truth. I like this passage because you see some of the... You see the truth being the most important. And the Apostle John here is writing to this Gaius and saying, I, I'm excited, I have joy that you're walking in the truth. And he also says, I, I hope you're in good health. We've been going through sickness this week, and it seems like we've been going through more and more over this, these past few years. I always tie it to prophecy. I think it's just true. In Matthew 24, 7 and 8, it says, For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences, and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Anybody else, anybody else seem to think that there's just more sicknesses out there? Aren't there? I think they're pestilences, and you can say, well, it's, I don't know what the cause is. There's maybe this cause or this cause. I don't know about all the causes, but I seem like there's all kinds of sicknesses out there, weird ones, strange ones. When I was a kid, it was like, once in a while you get a flu, the whole family would get the flu, right? And you all threw up. <laughs> you had your night. But now it's like I see people throwing up throughout the year. Crazy times. Um, one kid out of a family being sick, the rest not being sick. There's just these, it seems in my mind, new viruses out there, pestilences. A pestilence is the word for a plague. It's that word for a contagious disease. And I believe Matthew 24, 7 and 8 is a prophetic passage that has not happened yet. I believe it says in the end times we're going to have more earthquakes, we're going to have wars and rumors of wars, and we're going to have pestilences. And I think we see that. So what does a Christian do, though? Praise God that His Word gives us all kinds of guidance for how to go through hardship, especially, or not to leave out, uh, sickness. Going through sickness. Let's look at a passage back here. Um, while we're back here, let's look over at James, shall we? James chapter 5. Hi there, good to see you. Talking about sickness this morning it seems to be a, a relevant topic. Let's look at James chapter 5. I want to understand it, but I also want to deal with it as a Christian. Sickness comes, and if pestilence is going to increase, how does a Christian survive and not only survive, how do we thrive? How do we function? How do we continue to have church services? I think it's going to take some girding up of the loins, but there are some other ways we can look at it too. Look at James 5 and verse 10. Take my brethren the prophets, the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. One way we can get through all kinds of trouble is to look at this wonderful Bible and see saints of old who have gone through something even worse. Persecution that was worse, pain and suffering that was even worse. We can look at the prophets, the Bible says here, 11. Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job, and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. That word endure, I've been repeating that for my family all week. 
with Isaac, my son, my eight-year-old son. I said, well, we just gotta endure it. He hates it, he hates being sick. He's tired of cough and he's tired of being sick with his fever. I said, nothing I can do, buddy. If I could fix it, I'd fix it for you. If I could take it from you, I'd take it from you. But you gotta just endure it. Nothing else you can do. But I did show him this passage in our family devotions all together. It says, and it's seen the end of the Lord. The Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. That never changes. We still have a God that's very merciful. Very pitiful. He has pity on, uh, on those in need, on his, on his saints in particular. Look at 12. But above all things, my brethren, swear not, neither by heaven, neither by the earth, neither by any oath, but your neighbor, uh, your neighbor, 13. I'm skipping that, sorry. 13. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. My question for you this morning, with all the sickness that abounds, what about faith healing? Can we start this up? I've been practicing in my spare time about doing some faith healing. Uh, this is a real passage. Look at it. It says, Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over them, anointing him with the oil in the name of the Lord. I had some free time this week as I had a couple sick days or one sick day. And I, just to cheer me up, I was, I was watching some Kenneth Copeland just to get that healing power. <laughs> He's terrible, isn't he? Kenneth Copeland, the Benny Hens, all these con artists. It reminds me of that passage where they, uh, uh, what's that one? I've got it here somewhere. Oh yeah, which devour widows' houses and <laughs> for a pretense make long prayers. These fakers is what they are. But they'll have these healing services, supposedly, and they'll be speaking in tongues and stomping on the ground and healing these ailments. It's not of God. We could do a whole study on that. A few things I think about that. One, they're just fakers trying to steal wallets is what they're really doing. But I also remember, do you remember that passage that says that, we read it in our Luke series not long ago, said that Satan had bound up this woman for um, 18 years. We just read it last week. For these 18 years, Satan has the power to bind up people and give them um, ailments. So I, some of this healing stuff that you see happen, I don't deny that sometimes it could simply be Satan um, involved, directly involved with these situations. What can we gather from this passage? It's not, we're not called to have faith healing services. You see it nowhere in scripture. This is as close as you get, but it's not talking about that. And I'll explain more and more why as we go. But these faith healing services, they'll quote verses that I was listening to Kenneth Copeland. He was quoting the, the passage in Exodus. He was saying, when I see the blood, I will pass over you and the plague shall not be upon you. <laughs> so he's going to heal somebody. It just has nothing to do with that Passover story. It's not about healing someone's body. And then they were, they were quoting... Um, First Peter, let me, I, you can stay, oh, it's right next to this. First Peter, look at First Peter 2.24. Look at First Peter 2.24. Look at this one, would you? You tell me, is this talking about physical healing or spiritual healing? First Peter 2.24. Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live under righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. Of course, the, the, the con artists, faith healers, they say this passage is about physical healing. Is it talking about that? No, it's talking about a much more important healing, which is spiritual healing. The binding up of those wounds, those open sores, the sin sores covering our body. That's what those passages are talking about. But this one in James says that you can call for the elders. But the key here, it's all about prayer. It's all about praying for one another. Look, it says in verse 16, James 5, 16. I'm back in James now, 5, 16. Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. There's power in prayer. When someone's sick, you not only, you can wish that someone feels better, but you can pray for them to feel better. And God may hear that prayer. Or he will hear it, but God may answer that prayer. So what's, what's one thing we can do as Christians with pestilence around us, sickness around us? We can pray for one another, and we should. 
Sometimes it's hard when your head is all fevery and you're taking care of kids, uh, but you should stop and pray. I was trying to get our family to do that specifically last night. Let's just stop and pray. God honors prayer. He, he loves that faith he sees in mankind calling out in prayer. I think it's important to pray when you're sick because there, there are different kinds of sicknesses. This week, we're, as a church, we're seeing something that's, you know, it's going to be short term. But all the times disease has come up. You'll have a disease your whole life until the days you die. And you never want it to consume you and control you, right? But if you're not careful, it can be that. Like when I'm sick this week, all I'm thinking about is the sickness, the sickness, the sickness. Well, if I had anything stretched out over time, I wouldn't want that to define my whole life, would I? So we should practice, even in short-term sickness, practice rising above the sickness through the power of prayer, right? I still want us to rest. We should rest and feel better. But prayer can help us not be put under the strain of our bodies. We can keep our bodies in subjection under us. Look at 2 Corinthians 12. For the faith healers, they are confused about a lot of things. And so I'm going to I'm preach in a semi-rebuke to them, but then we're also going to look at some passages that can help the Christian during time of sickness. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And verse 7, the, the, the question, the key question here, is it God's will for everyone to be healed? If you go to a faith healing service, obviously it's, it's God's will for everyone to be healed. That plague not going to pass over you, a Rosh Hashanah stomp on the ground kind of stuff. <laughs> but God doesn't deal that way. It wasn't God's will for, for Paul to be healed. Look at this, 12, 7. Unless they should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. And for this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. There's Paul praying, and he's a man of faith. We know that. But he's not getting healed. Look at verse 9. And he said, in, and he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. He prayed, he prayed, he prayed, and that's the answer God gave back to him. That's the answer God gave back. My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. I think when we're sick, well, the easy point here, not everyone is going to get healed. It's not God's will for everyone to be healed of every ailment. Sometimes He uses it for His glory, for His honor, and to keep us weak so that He might be strong through us. But when we're sick, we can see a couple of things here. When we're sick, we should try to rise above it and pray. Right? Don't forget to pray when we're sick. And try to rise above it and think about the power of Christ. How can Christ use us in our weak state? I don't, I, I, I don't want to seem like, um, I know I've preached sermons. I think some of the more powerful sermons God had me preach were times I was sick. I think I remember different sermons. I think I remember, wasn't, weren't Sandra and Pat? Yeah, when that day you guys came to the Lord, I believe I didn't even have a voice that day. Hardly, yeah, we just got over some big sickness. Think about canceling church. And we had a really good Sunday there in the shop, in our little garage. And I think they got saved that day, that night. Yeah. I think God does use us sometimes in our weakest state uh, to do big things. So ask God. Maybe then in your home, with, when you're in your sickest moment and the kids are in the sickest moment, maybe there's going to be a breakthrough for your kids spiritually about that time. Who knows? You never know. We don't know how God works and how He might use something difficult for His honor and glory. All we see is, oh, it's difficult. It's no fun. Get me out of this thing. Get me off the ride. We got we to gotta rise above. I'm not one that's going to say we're, I'm ready to glory in my infirmities, but that's where Paul got to. Glory in his infirmities. He saw God work in his life. Why do we get sick? Uh, I've mentioned a few things. Sickness can obviously can be judgment. We know this. It, let's look at Hebrews real fast. I think I just covered this recently, so sorry for the repeat. But I'm going to lead to a point. Why do we get sick? Why do people get sick? 
Hebrews 13, I'm going to say the one that offends a lot of people, but it's very true. Look at Hebrews 13, verse 4. Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. Some sickness absolutely comes because of judgment by Almighty God. And this is different than the chastisement of a saint. There is judgment. You see that in this passage in Hebrews 13, 4. In Romans 1, 27, remember it talks about the sodomites, men with men working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their heir which was meat. Surely the, the homosexual lifestyle and HIV AIDS, that's a consequence, that's a judgment from a sinful lifestyle. It says in Psalm 68, 21, But God shall wound the head of his enemies, and the hairy scalp of such an one as goeth on still in his trespasses. There is judgment that comes for choosing sin and continuing down that path of sin. There is. Not just in the life to come, but in this life you see that. Especially, I think you see that with some of these um, sexual sins. You really see God's judgment for those kinds of abominable sins, whether it be breaking the marriage bed or breaking the, the uh, man and woman relationship. Why else do we get sick? Look at Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6. I'm trying to set us up for a bigger point here, so please bear with me. But why do we get sick? Sometimes it can be judgment. Hebrews 12, 6 says, For the whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. We also get sick. It might not be judgment, but it's this chastisement. It's this testing of the Lord. It's this chastening. You could say, Logan, it's the same thing. I don't think it's, I don't think it's exactly the same thing. When God brings down judgment on that homosexual lifestyle or that, that whoremonger or adulterer lifestyle or any other sin that, where they dwell therein, it's not exactly a corrective action. It's a punitive action. It's like this is the penalty for living in the pig pen. Whereas these Christians, these are, these are believers here in Hebrews, and whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. So sometimes we do get sick because God wants to teach us a lesson. He wants us to grow. He wants us to be uh, challenged, be tested in our faith. Kind of like that Job situation, right? Job says in Job 23.10, But he knoweth the way that I take. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. It's absolutely a thing. Right? Some of these sicknesses and these challenges in life can be for our testing for our discipline, for our growing as our Father would have us grow. Why else do we get sick? It can be judgment, it can be chastisement. It also simply stems from the fact that we're all dying. Look at Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. Say, hey, Logan, that sounds pleasant. Well, it's a fact of life. Look at Romans 5. And I was, I was using this sickness this week to tell some of my kids about this. I don't know who it was, Liza or Isaac again. Why do we have hardship in this life? Look at Romans 5, verse... 12, I know the answers. Can you imagine going through hard things and not having any answers for your kids? Like I was able to tell my kids, well, you know, we have hardship because it's all related to sin. Man ruined this world. Look at 5.12. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all is sinned. Look at Romans 6.23. Romans 6.23, For the wage of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. When sin came from Adam and Eve, when they first sinned, all the problems in the world start. You have the thorns and the branches. You have death and dying. From that point, uh, you know, the, the question was, Thou shalt not surely die. Well, they didn't die that minute, but right at that moment when they sinned and they took of that fruit they weren't supposed to take, they started dying, right? And I'll bet you Adam and Eve, they saw their bodies decay like ours did. They lived a lot longer than us, I'm sure. But I'm sure they started feeling the pains over the years, the same pains that we feel. Now in our 70, 80 years, if we're lucky, we start feeling some of these pains in our life. Our body's starting to fall apart. It all goes back to sin, this fallen world. We're all dying over time. Look at Romans 8, 21. It speaks to this expressly. Look at Romans 8, 21. 
So if you're a biblicist and you have a Bible in your hand, you can explain these things to people that, yeah, sickness can be judgment. It can be chastisement, testing. It's also just a natural part of life that really should point somebody back to the fact that we're all sinners. Right? We're all sinners. And you point them to the Savior. Romans 8, 21 says, Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption and the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole crea creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. The whole creation groaneth. I love my son Isaac, and we were up from about 2.30. He never did sleep. He was groaning and coughing from about 2.30 to this morning. And so neither of us slept from that time. But he groans and he groans and he groans. And I said, Isaac, I can't help you. I know you're telling me you need help, but I can't help you. The whole creation is groaning, though, in these pains of death and dying. Look at verse 23. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of our body. For we are saved by hope, but Hope that is seen is not hope, for what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then we do with patience wait for it. For the Christian, you have this wonderful thing of hope. Your life may be terrible. You may get the worst disease on the face of the earth, but you have hope of a brighter day to come, a wonderful day, a new body with God. The heavenly home and presence of Christ, our Savior. We have so much hope as, as Christians. The world who doesn't believe this Bible, they think they're just sick randomly. Doesn't matter about sin. Sin's not real, and the Savior's not real, and heaven's not real. That is depressing. That's a hopeless state. It really is. This Bible is hope for the world, but people don't believe it. So people get depressed. People get a, a rough diagnosis, and sometimes it can rock their whole life because the only thing they had was their health. The only thing they had was uh, their finances. And when you take those away, what do they have left? The Christian rock that we stand upon is this Bible. Isn't it, amen? This is how you build strong individuals. Some of these things we're talking about this morning are things that you and I, we know, we've read. But friends, we've heard them, we've read them, they're ingrained in our souls, and that, that's part of the stability you have in your life, right? That we still trust Christ through thick and thin, through it all, we're going to stand strong, we still have hope to come. And we not only just have hope, God gives uh, His family all kinds of blessings. Look at 826, His saints, look at 826. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, Romans 826. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Sometimes we don't know what to pray. We don't know how to commune with our God. But we've got this indwelling Holy Spirit that makes intercessory prayers for us. And praise the Lord, we do have a high priest which can be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, right? Christ came and took upon the form of man, and he went through all the points he's tempted as we are, yet without sin. Christ came and faced all the sickness, all the pain, including the extreme pain of the crucifixion. He's felt it all, and that same God is the God that feels our pain today. Feels our infirmities, knows what we're going through, and this Holy Spirit then talks to God the Father on our behalf. It's an amazing thing. And no, this isn't talking about tongues. Someone the other day was telling me, see, look, here are these groanings, see? Well, it says groanings which cannot be uttered. These are silent prayers being made from the seat of your soul with the Holy Spirit talking to God on your behalf with your infirmities. Praise the Lord. Isn't that a blessing? You may not know how to pray for your health, your infirmities, but you've got the intercessor, intercessory Holy Spirit doing that job for you. Prayer, talking to God about these things matters. Bringing up your request before God, bringing your burdens before the Lord. It really matter. If I take anything away from this sixth season that we're having at our church this last week, it's that I think prayer. 
Prayer is the key. More time to pray, let's pray more. It's hard though, I know, especially when you've got a fever and you're going in and out a little bit, but let's pray, let's pray for one another. I had time to pray last night. I actually finally did a decent job. Of, I felt like Brother Bennett. I prayed for everybody and the sailors and the seamen, and the, but actually had nothing else to do. I wasn't sleeping, so I actually had time to pray for every person, not every person, but a lot of people I know by name um, and with detail. And it felt good to pray for people. Look at, look at when it says, um, look at down at 35. I, I was quoting that verse. Let me read it for you directly. Hebrews 4.15. Let me read it. Just read it for you. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. We have a high priest which can be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. And he, he, he was tempted in all those ways. He knows exactly what we're going through. And it's a big deal. I don't trivial, trivialize or make a small thing about infirmities because the Bible doesn't. The Bible says infirmity is a real challenge. So when someone tells me they got a disease or a sickness, you bet you it's a real challenge. It's a real thing and God knows it's a real challenge for us as feeble creatures to go through ailments. He knows. So we should pray for one another when health comes up that it's a problem. Look, at, look down here at 835. But with everything that comes up, with all the problems that you might face in your life and your health and those around you being sick, isn't that the worst when people you love are sick around you? That's the worst in my mind. But look at 835. What can we still trust? 835, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? Will anything separate us from the love of God? Even this distress that we go through, even this death and dying we have in our bodies. Does that mean God doesn't uh, love His children anymore? No, He loves His believers. We're secure in God's love. Why? Because of what Christ did for us. Can't take that away. So even as our bodies fall apart and we go through pain and suffering, we have a God that absolutely loves us because of what Christ did for us. 36, as it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. It's a nice promise, isn't it? The promise, because of Christ, we can count on God's love being unconditional. People talk about God's unconditional love, but you know what makes it unconditional? The blood of Jesus Christ washes your sins away, right? But if you rejected Christ's blood, that love there, uh, you rejected the love that God sent in His Son to the world. Believers have found God's love in Jesus Christ, and, and nothing can take that away from you. Nothing can take that away from you. I have a question for you. Is it biblical to go to a doctor? Is it biblical to take medicine? Let's look at this. We've got about 10 minutes left. This is a random study on sickness. <laughs> Second Chronicles 16. Let's look at this and think about this a little bit. I think there's a good line that we need to draw on this topic about doctors and medicines. I know some of you guys are so pro-vax that you've got every single vaccination under the sun. <laughs> I'm not judging you. Whatever, if that's the way he wants to be, then go for it. <laughs> Second Chronicles 16. Yeah, I, I'm afraid. As I've been thinking this week about people playing God. You know those passages I was just reading about, we're all, it's all, the creation groaneth and travaileth. We are never going to get rid of sickness. Hey, good morning. We're never going to get rid of all sicknesses. This earth is always going to be plagued by pestilence and sickness and our bodies going downhill. But I think as mankind, we think we're gods. And so we think we're going to have, oh, we're going to overcome this disease and this disease and this disease with this concoction, this concoction. We play God, but a lot of times I don't even think we realize what it's doing to other parts of our bodies, you know. 
I think it's messing up other things. Some of these unnatural diseases now I think we see today are the result of some of this people in laboratories playing God. And yeah, they might fix one little thing with some sort of concoction, but they don't know what it's doing to the rest of the population. They don't know. Playing God. I, sickness will always abound, and for us to act like we can beat it, stomp it out, it's not possible. But should we go to the doctor, having said all that? Let's look at Second Chronicles 16 12. Because there are some people, including in Idaho, there are people who will not go to the doctor, right? They don't believe that you should. I talked to a man on the phone a couple months back, and he believes he, he's, he should not go to the doctor. He's not going to the doctor, even though he's got a very severe ailment. I believe he said he has a, a flesh eating disorder, I believe. Sound, sounded terrible. But he didn't want to go to the doctor. He quoted this passage, and I love this passage. Look, 1612. And Asa in the 30 and 9th year of his reign was diseased in his feet until his disease was exceeding great. Yet in his disease he sought not to the Lord but to the physicians. And Asa slept with his fathers and died in the 1 and 40th year of his reign. This is that king. But what is it teaching us? He went to the doctors, right? But, but what it's really teaching us is he didn't go to God. It's not, this isn't a prohibition on ever going to a doctor taking medicine. What it is in my mind, it's a real clue of, if you're sick, you, you better go to the great physician. You better talk to God, right? So we shouldn't take it out of context or blow it out of proportion. It's not a prohibition going to a doctor, but it is a proof text that says your trust should still be in Almighty God. So if you're going to start putting all your trust in doctors and in the hospital and in the medicine, you might be setting yourself up for a lot of failure. Because what God might really want for you at that time is to talk to Him. Either talk to Him for a solution or talk to Him because you're supposed to be growing during this cycle, right? But instead, you're forgetting about God and His process of, of chasing you or growing you or testing you. You're forgetting about all that. Instead, you're focused all on man. You're missing the whole point of the activity. The, whole point, the, only, thing, the only thing that we can glory in is our, our infirmities, the only thing to glory in is that God's involved. And God can do it for His honor and glory and for the betterment of our souls. So when we just think about, oh, I'm just going to get better, 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 going to focus on getting better, 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 we're missing the point of God, aren't we? That was the problem here. But this man I talked to over the phone, and I, I love him, sound like a, a dear brother, but we don't agree on this. But he wouldn't go to the doctor, and he's got this flesh-eating disorder. Um, and he was against doctors. But that's, there's, bad, there's proof text that doctors are okay. There's a man called the beloved physician. Luke was a doctor. Right? Look, look at um, the book of Luke, 1034. The book of Luke, 1034. should seek God, but sometimes God can send you a Luke to help you. Look at 1034. Sometimes God can send you a good Samaritan to help you. Look at 10, uh, yeah, Luke 10, verse 34. Let's read verse 33, 1033. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him. And he went, oh, and by the way, that passage in James, I didn't even comment on the, on the oil, right? People get into all this healing oil and healing services. I, th I simply believe the oil to be talking in a spiritual sense, prayer. You see that throughout the Bible, that oil is a type of prayer. So I point it back to prayer. But here, the Samaritan's going to use some oil, too, to bind him up. 34, and went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, and brought him to an inn and took care of him. Well, the Good Samaritan could have just came by and trusted God and said, well, be healed. God's going to heal you. But no, he just did some practical things and he bound him up. He helped him, right? There are some practical things and God can send some practical things our way to help us in time of need. And sometimes doctors can be that practical thing and medicine can be that practical thing. Don't lose your trust in God. Don't put all your trust in mankind. 
But still, God can use practical things to do His will. Here you see that with the Good Samaritan, healing this man and bringing him on his way. If you believe, like this man I met with the flesh-eating disorder, or who I talked to on the phone, what I ended up telling him in a very polite way was that I think you're tempting God. Look at Luke chapter 4 and verse 9. Some of these folks who are looking for faith, healing, they say, well, if you just had enough faith, right? You don't have enough faith, Logan. That's why you're not doing what I'm doing. I have all this faith. And meanwhile, his, his flesh is being eaten, eaten away. The family's all distraught about it. But he was uh, speaking about faith. Well, you don't have the faith that I do. Well, my response was, don't tempt God. You can. I mean, uh, maybe Brother Kent would go stand out in the road right out there in the middle of it and be like, I've got faith. But I would say, you're tempting God out there, standing in the middle of the road. That's not where God wants you to be. It's a place of danger. And so when you, you've got these ailments, it might be that God's going to have you go get some medicine for that flesh-eating disorder. It might take your kid into the doctor when they've got a really high fever or whatever. You, you never know. That's what it says here in Luke 4, 9. It says, and he brought, remember the devil brings Jesus up. 4, 9, he brought him to Jerusalem and set him on a pinnacle of the temple and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down from hence. Now, doesn't Jesus have enough faith here? Watch what Jesus says, though, 10. For, er, he doesn't say here, but this is the devil talking. For it is written, he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee. In their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against the stone. And Jesus answering said unto him, It is said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Jesus Christ did not have a faith problem. But Jesus Christ also knew and tells us this principle of we should not be tempting God, right? Absolutely. God could have caught him, but it wasn't God's will for him to jump. It wouldn't be God's will to stand in the middle of the road. And so pray about that if you're going to use this idea of I don't have enough faith to not receive the services of a good Samaritan. It might just be pride holding you back instead of prayer. We should not tempt God in our lives. Uh, does that make sense to everybody? Talking about the faith healers, I believe what they're really doing, some of the people who don't believe in hospitals or doctors at all, I really believe they're tempting God. And God says, well, you know, I sent the Good Samaritan right there down the street from you, and your kid could completely get um, fixed up with that, whatever that flu is or whatever that problem is. You're tempting me. We're almost out of time. We sure are. Let's close back where we started. 3 John 1. Sorry, I know I'm a little tired and dry this morning. been a little bit sick this week. But these are some passages I saw. There are a bunch more good ones, aren't there? I'm sure we could go to all the ones that actually encourage me. I like the ones that um, um, on the rock, God's our fortress, our help in time of need. Read through all the Psalms are good if you just want your soul to be enriched when you're sick. Go back to 3 John, which we already read to start us off. We'll read it again. 3 John 1, 1. The elder unto the beloved Gaius, whom I love in the truth. Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. For I rejoice greatly when the children came and testified of the truth that is in thee, even as thou walkest in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in the truth. Health problems are always going to be there. We're going to have them in this dying body we have until we drop this robe of flesh and we rise to be with our Savior. We're always going to have health problems. So to rise above them, we need things like prayer, right? We need spiritual eyesight to think about God's glory and our testing and who God wants us to become in hardship and trial and sickness. How is He molding and making us, right? The exercise, if we're, not, if we're not praying and thinking about these things, we're missing the true exercise of what sickness is there for, what we can get out of it. There's no way we're going to glory in our infirmities if we're not even thinking about God.
or praying to God or thinking about His glory. And then in this passage, I'd like to leave you with the thought of, yes, your health prospering is, is nice, but your soul prospering is even more important. Someone being spiritually sick is much worse than physically sick. Someone being spiritually alive is important. Someone walking in the truth. This is what's key. Look at 5. Beloved, thou doest faithfully whatsoever thou doest to the brethren, to strangers, which have borne witness of thy charity before the church, whom if thou bring forward on the journey after a godly sort, thou shalt do well, because that for, thy, for his name's sake they went forth, taking nothing to the Gentiles. We therefore ought to receive such that we might be fellow helpers to the truth. Sickness in many ways creates opportunity. And that's kind of weird, isn't it? But sickness creates opportunity for us to stop our lives and pray because there's nothing else you can do about that point. We've got to pray and go to the, the real man, the real answer, the one who heals, wounds, heals, kills, makes alive God who controls all things. We've got to go to God. It's an opportunity also to grow and examine our lives. What are we supposed to be learning from this? And sickness also creates an opportunity, I really think, to serve others. You can, right? You find other people in need and all of a sudden you've never been given an opportunity to serve before, but all of a sudden now the church needs you. All of a sudden now your home needs you in a different way. At our house, when my, it was funny, our kids were sick first and then my wife and I were, were the most sick. And it went from us serving them to them serving us. And we quickly found that we served them better than they served us. <laughs> but they were trying. They were trying. Is Hudson doing everything he needs to be doing over there? <laughs> but it does. God uses some of these things, these moving parts in lives. Um, I think for the body of Christ really to play out and for us to help brethren in need and here be fellow helpers to the truth. We've got services to hold today and I praise God that we're able to hold them. We've got enough strength to hold them today. So let's go to the Lord in prayer, huh? And let's uh, stay strong even in sickness. Let's find the, the, the um, positive side of sickness and there always is because we have a God that's real. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, that you understand that we are frail people who, Lord, who are in the process of dying because of sin. But, Lord, you understand our frailties. You understand our infirmities because your Son took upon flesh and went through everything that we've ever seen and more. Lord, we thank you for this. We thank you for the healing that came from Christ, the spiritual healing, Lord, that's, that's above any kind of physical healing by far, Lord, how it washed our sins away. And, uh, Lord, closed up our wounds, uh, the sin sores we have throughout our bodies. But, Lord, we also thank you that you can be with us in trial, in tribulation. Help us to remember you and you first and foremost whenever we're sick. Help us to grow during these times when we're sick not just to waste the moment. Help us to share faith with our kids and those around us so they might grow as well. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.